Welcome to this talk. Um, my name is uh, Sören. This is my uh, colleague uh, Martin. We are both uh, software engineers at the company uh, Neo4j. That's a graph company. And we're both working on the uh, graph analytics team. Um, that means uh, we maintain two projects. One is uh, Morpheus, which we're going to present uh, today a bit. And the other uh, project we maintain is uh, a graph algorithms library, which we also going to mention in this talk. So let's uh, dive right in, a uh, bit on motivation. So why should you uh, bother about graphs at all? So uh, we at Neo4j, we say, um, or we like to say graphs are everywhere. And the way we think of this is um, uh, in your daily work, like uh, if you're a software engineer or a manager, you likely uh, come across a problem that is inherently a graph, even if you uh, don't uh, treat it as a graph because your pipeline or your software stack don't support, doesn't support graphs. And we can imagine uh, some use, use cases there. Um, for example, uh, you can see on the left, um, that's a network. So um, Facebook, for example, uses graphs for social network analysis. Um, in the middle, you can see uh, like uh, astronaut. Uh, so um, Neo4j helped, the, uh, helped uh, NASA um, to create a knowledge graph to speed up their uh, Mars mission. And on the right, um, that's uh, fraud detection. So that's the title uh, cover of the uh, Panama Papers leak. And uh, we at Neo4j helped uh, journalists to um, make sense of the leaked data in this massive uh, Panama Papers uh, data set. So um, graph databases are becoming increasingly uh, popular, as you can see here. This is a chart from uh, dbengines.com. And dbengines uses um, things like Stack Overflow questions, uh, GitHub stars, and uh, some other metrics to uh, measure the, um, uh, yeah, the popularity of a database. And uh, this is the relative growth uh, in popularity across uh, some years, not the absolute. Uh, so you can see there's a clear trend uh, towards the top uh, from, for graphs. Um, whenever I talk of uh, graphs uh, in this talk, I mean um, the property graph model. That's a specific type of graph. And um, this consists uh, mainly of the two different uh, elements. So uh, one of the elements uh, are nodes uh, or vertices. Um, and nodes um, represent your objects or items of your problem domain. So you can see on the graph um, drawn on the, on the right side, uh, we have uh, two different kinds of nodes. We have uh, two person nodes and one car node. And the thing person and car are actually labels. So we call them labels so you can identify what the node is doing. And um, the second element of a property graph is a relationship or an edge. And relationships uh, connect uh, two nodes in a directed way. And um, so you can have a link between uh, two nodes, or you can even do a self-relationship. And um, those are also kind of labels, so you can name them, but uh, we call them type when they are on relationship. So for example, on uh, the two uh, person nodes are connected with uh, three edges. Um, so the person then loves Anne, and fortunately for him, and loves him back. So we have two uh, direct uh, relationships in opposite directions. And uh, um, the thing that makes this graph a property uh, graph model is, of course, a property. So you can attach uh, key value pairs on either uh, nodes and relationships. And those uh, pairs can contain strings or booleans or, or numbers. And that's how we store our data in a graph. So in order to retrieve the data back from the graph, um, we are using something called uh, pattern matching. And in order to uh, make this available for everyone, um, Neo4j invented a language called Cypher that leverages pattern matching. And uh, Cypher is designed uh, to be as close to uh, SQL as possible to make it an easy transition from SQL. Um, but you can see the first clause in the uh, bottom line uh, says match. And uh, this introduces or this uh, identifies a pattern matching um, that's quite similar to a select, but for the graph world. And um, the way you define a, a pattern graph you want to, to match the graph on is um, by using um, so-called ASCII art. So um, for example, if we want to retrieve a, a person node, we are using a round parentheses because uh, nodes in a 
in a, a graph are often displayed as circles, so round parentheses are like the closest thing you can get to circles with ASCII. And um, relationships are naturally displayed uh, with arrows, as you can see um, in the middle. So, um, and if you want to restrict the type of a relationship or the label of a node, you can um, put a colon and then identifier uh, on it, and so you only get person nodes, for example, or last relationships. And also you can um, define variables, uh, like it is um, uh, drawn here, the whom is a variable, and a variable you can refer to in the further query, like in the return statement. So graphs are also uh, coming to Spark. So earlier this year we um, introduced a, a vote for the community uh, for a Spark improvement proposal, and this uh, vote passed, so we are currently implementing um, it and merging it into the Spark code base. So what it does, um, we are uh, bringing a property graph uh, type um, based on data frames uh, to the uh, code base, so you can run Cypher, which I just introduced on it. And also we are gonna, or not we are, but uh, Spark is gonna deprecate uh, graph frames in favor of this, and uh, will also um, re-implement uh, graph algorithms, algorithms that uh, were present on graph frames. If you want to check that out, um, we have a, uh, proof of concept uh, branch, uh, which you can find uh, in the link on the top right. And yeah, you can uh, build it, uh, play with it, run some cipher queries. So uh, with this uh, improvement proposal, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to solve? So we're creating a thing called uh, Spark Cipher, and uh, Spark Cipher is, um, will be capable of running Cipher on property graphs, and those property graphs are gonna be composed of multiple data frames, so we, we are using Spark SQL underneath. And uh, we are also gonna provide um, APIs for um, Scala, Python, and uh, Java. And um, this talk is not about um, what's in the SPIP, but if you're interested what's uh, coming soon, you can um, join another talk tomorrow of our colleagues. It's called Graph Features in Spark 3.0. It's at 11 a.m., so make sure to step by. So on a higher level, what um, does this SPIP look like? So as I mentioned before, on the lowest level, we got um, Spark SQL, which we translate to. And uh, on top of it, we um, define two new mod modules. One is uh, Spark Cypher, which is essentially the engine, or yeah, most of the engine behind it. And on top of that, we have a Spark Graph API module, which uh, includes all the user-facing APIs. And uh, now we have a short demo. Yeah, we wanted to uh, just show you um, a sneak peek. Uh, as Soren said, uh, tomorrow we are, there will be a deep, deep dive session on uh, Spark Craft, but uh, this basically shows you what you can expect from uh, this module. So you have your uh, Spark session as you, uh, I guess, know it already, and using a Spark session you can uh, create a Spark Cypher session, um, which is basically a sibling of a Spark session. and. Um, here we can create uh, so-called node data sets, which represent the nodes in the graph, and they are, of course, also relationship data sets, which represent relationships, and they are both based on data frames. So we use the uh, Spark API to create data frames, in that case, two, two rows that uh, contain an ID and a property, it's just a name in that sense, and then uh, using that data frame, we create uh, a so-called node data set, which we can then use to create a graph. So this is a very simple graph, it just contains um, just contains node data, but on that graph we can then just say graph.cypher and run a cypher query, which in that uh, example here just matches all the nodes in the graph and returns those objects. And then you can, as you are used to it from data frames, just call .show and you see the result as a tabular result. Okay, back to me. So <clears throat> what are we not uh, solving with the um, improvement proposal? So um, we are addressing only the uh, property graph uh, model currently, so no uh, support for RDF or anything else. And um, as you might know from um, Spark SQL, you will know the concept of a catalog where you can manage um, different data sources that you can wrangle together to um, yeah, manage basically multiple tables. So um, we are not providing a catalog uh, right now, but however, our API is um, 
capable of uh, extending uh, this uh, for the future. So um, in future iterations, um, we will be able to um, provide a catalog and uh, for managing different data sources. Um, however, if you want to use that now, um, there's Morpheus. So uh, Morpheus is our product uh, from uh, Neo4j, and we call it uh, also SparkGraph for the enterprise. So it is an extended uh, feature set uh, compared to uh, SparkGraph. And so let's ask the question first, uh, where do we see Morpheus in the OLTP, OLAP uh, landscape? So um, like I said before, um, Neo4j um, covers the, the uh, field of uh, transactional graphs quite well. And uh, for the analytics side of things, um, we got uh, Spark SQL, which has a large adoption um, and uh, covers uh, relational tables. But uh, for the uh, graph world or graph analytics world, there wasn't such a thing. So uh, this is where we imagine Morpheus. And what you can do uh, with Morpheus, uh, you can uh, create uh, property graphs um, from different data sources like you would do it in uh, Spark uh, SQL. You can um, incorporate different uh, sources like uh, uh, file systems um, or uh, other um, relational databases, pull that data in or load from Neo4j and create one or more property graphs out of it. You can, of course, um, wrangle property graphs or uh, query them, as I introduced before. So uh, as you can see on the uh, bottom part of this uh, slide, um, you can um, run a cipher query on a property graph, and uh, in the SPIP, every cipher query will return a tabular result, which is, again, a data frame. So afterwards, you can, of course, use uh, SQL, but uh, you can't uh, uh, process another cipher query. And um, with Morpheus, what you can do, you can do like a iterative uh, cipher querying and uh, returning results, like you can do in uh, Spark SQL as well. So uh, with the cipher query, you can also return a graph and use that as a new input for the engine and uh, run another cipher query or not, how you want. So you can also um, analyze graphs, and uh, you can do this in uh, two ways. So uh, starting off with a property graph, um, which is essentially just composed of uh, data frames, you can immediately fall back to every tooling that Spark already uh, provides because you operate on uh, data frames and you can use uh, SparkML, for example, or anything you want. What you can also do, you can um, export the property graph to a Neo4j instance and run uh, our graph algorithms library on top of it. And afterwards, you can, after you uh, altered the data in the uh, instance, got some feature extraction, you can import the uh, data back again to Morpheus and you end up with the property graph in Morpheus again. And last but not least, you can, of course, uh, store back uh, graphs. So um, like I said before, you can store it to Neo4j, but you can also um, store a snapshot of a graph in the file system using whatever um, data source uh, Spark SQL can provide, like uh, org, parquet, CSV. So um, Morpheus is essentially a SQL plus Cypher in one session. So um, we like to say graphs and tables are both use, uh, useful data models, and um, so it would be cool to um, be able to use both. So we do this by uh, paralleling Spark SQL. That means um, we create a Cypher session that essentially just wraps a Spark session and provides uh, additional value, additional uh, features. Uh, like I said, property graphs, for example, and on those property graphs, you can, of course, uh, run Cypher then. But you can, of course, also fall back to the Spark session and use whatever the Spark session provides. So uh, all in all, what is uh, Morpheus uh, used for? So uh, one of the biggest selling points is uh, the data integration. So you can uh, incorporate multiple, possibly non graphy data sources, um, process them and create a property graph out of them or multiple property graphs. And because we're using uh, Spark SQL underneath, um, whenever we call Cypher, this will be executed in a distributed fashion. So you can uh, use any cluster you would like. And with that, you can um, do uh, data science, of course. So you can integrate with other Spark uh, libraries, as I mentioned before, or you do feature extraction uh, with the Neo4j graph algorithms library. And speaking of which, um, 
this is a new um, product we offer, and uh, you can check out the link on the top uh, right if you want to know more about. But with Morpheus, uh, we have the capability of uh, using all of those uh, uh, algorithms you can see in the slide. Um, there's also a free book you can download if you're interested. Uh, go to neo4j.com slash graph-algorithms.book. And um, in this book, we explain a few algorithms and examples how you use them in Neo4j and Spark. And that's it for me. Thank you. So let's uh, look, about, uh, look into the Cypher features that uh, Morpheus provides. So Cypher, as John already said, is uh, our language from Neo4j for uh, graph carrying. It's also an open language, and uh, the standard, or kind of the current version of the language is defined in the Open Cypher project. And the latest version is Cypher 9, which is fully implemented in Neo4j 3.5, which is our latest release. Um, it's also implemented by other vendors and other research projects and also like industry projects. And there's also a compiler for Kremlin, which is also a craft traversal language. So Cypher 9, uh, because it has been designed by Neo4j for an operational um, OLTP database, um, it's a CRUD language, which means you can create, read, update, delete those nodes and relationships that we explained earlier. Um, and the return statement basically always returns a tabular result. So you do your pattern matching and then you get a tabular result as we saw earlier in this little sneak peek demo. Um, Morpheus and also the SPIP uh, that we mentioned, so Spark Graph implements, of course, read-only Cypher because we cannot mutate the data frames underneath. However, in Morpheus with Cypher 10, we are able to support multiple graphs, which also includes the feature of a query returning a graph instead of a table. And if a, a language allows you to have a graph as input and have a graph as output for a query, you can compose queries to more complex pipelines. And that's uh, basically what Cypher 10 is uh, proposing with the multiple graph uh, improvement proposal uh, that we linked here. And um, it also introduces the concept of a graph catalog, uh, which allows you to manage multiple graphs. And that's also a feature that we bring into Morpheus, and it's very analogous to the Spark SQL catalog, which allows you to uh, administer or manage multiple databases or data sources. And in order, since it's still a read-only um, uh, query on, on, on the data frames, we have uh, introduced query support for graph construction, uh, which I will demonstrate next. So let's start with a very simple example. So on the, on the following slides, the, the blue part of the query is basically what is capable in Morpheus. So it's a Cypher 10 language feature. And the, the black part or the dark blue part is uh, Cypher 9, which is uh, part of uh, Neo4j, for example. So for that query here, the input is a property graph because we say from graph social network, that's a specific name uh, which we use to address a graph. This can be stored in whatever data source uh, we imagine. And then on top of that graph, we run a, a pattern matching query where we look for uh, friends of a friend of a person called Dan and just return the names of those friend of a friend. So it's basically persons that are two hops away from um, Dan in that scenario. We order the result by name and um, return it. So the output here is a tabular result because it's just a table which contains the names um, of those friend of friends. However, uh, in Cypher 10, you have the possibility to also output a property graph. So here we, again, the input is a property graph, the same social network. And here we run a, a very similar query, but here we run it basically for all the persons where we say, um, uh, look for the friend of a friend. So basically persons that are two hops away and the where clause, the predicate basically tells uh, only select those which, are not or, which I'm not already connected to. So it's basically the friends of my friends that I not already know. And that means they could be a possible friend of mine. And the construct statement that we see at the bottom of the query basically allows us to create a new graph based on the information we get from the, from the previous part of the query. So here we create new relationships between the, the person and the friend of a friend, and we call that relationship type possible friend, and return that graph. And now we can basically operate another query on top of that graph, basically do, for example, an aggregation to count how many possible friends a person has. You can also um, uh, input multiple property graphs into the query. So that's a very interesting example, in my opinion. So here we have um, two graphs as input. The first graph is, again, the social network, 
where we select basically all the persons that are stored in that social network. Then we switch the context to another graph, which is called products. Could be a graph that represents your ERP system, or your customer database, uh, where we match all the customers and we do a value join on the email address, for example, or some other identifying attribute. So we basically link the persons from one graph with the customers from another graph and assume that if they have the same email address, it's the same person. And then in the construct on um, uh, example here, in the construct on clause, we basically build on top of the two existing graphs, social network and products, we create a new relationship that says the person in the social network is the customer in the products graph and return basically the union of the input graphs plus the additional uh, relationship which of course allows us to do uh, more recommendation based on uh, the data we get from the social network and the data we get from the ERP system. It's also possible to create graph views with Cypher 10, uh, which means you can basically uh, create a function where the input is always a graph and then uh, the, the, the body, basically the statement within that function is being executed on the input graph. So here, for example, we create a view which is called young friends and the inner query, the nested statement, basically selects persons that are connected to each other, and both of those persons are below 25 years old, and then we construct a new graph and return that as, as a result of that uh, view. And of course, you can use that view, uh, that view. For example, in the first part, we say from young friends, social network, which is again a reference to uh, a property graph. Uh, we compute those young friends, and then we do another match query on top of the result. And of course, you can also nest uh, those views because um, they return graphs, which means they are composable. So for example, we first select all the European persons from a social network, that could be a different view. And then uh, out of those, we select the young friends again. So let's talk about uh, managing multiple graphs in the graph catalog. So from a conceptual point of view, um, like I said, property graphs are managed within a catalog and the catalog uh, is basically part of the Cypher session, which as Soren already said, wraps the Spark session. So that is your entry point to the Spark uh, graph world and also Morpheus in that uh, example here. So the property graph catalog uh, ex uh, um, exists exactly once per Cypher session, but it can manage multiple property graph data sources. It's a very similar concept to the Spark data sources like the file system based ones or Hive and so on. And each property graph data source is identified by a namespace and within the data source, I can store multiple property graphs, which are identified by a name. So, and the so-called qualified graph name, so to, in order to uniquely identify a graph, it's basically the concatenation of the namespace of the data source and the name of the graph. So, what are the data sources that Morpheus uh, provides? Uh, we support all the file-based ones that also Spark uh, supports, basically a CSV as the most simple one, org, parquet can also connect to, of course, HDFS, uh, local file system in S3. There's a SQL data source that allows you to uh, read a graph uh, from Hive via JDBC. Um, and there are, of course, uh, Neo4j specific data sources that allow you to read and write graphs from and to Neo4j. And um, yeah. So how does it look like uh, in an example? So here, for example, we have uh, our property graph catalog and we have one property graph data source registered under the namespace social net. It's a Neo4j property graph data source. And within Neo4j, we have one property graph stored uh, under the name US. So if we want to query that graph, we basically refer to its qualified graph name by saying from social net, which is our data source, dot US, which is the graph name, match all the persons and return them. The second query I also introduced earlier, which brings together um, two different graphs, uh, is this displayed here. So here on the left-hand side, we see that we have two property graph data sources, one in Neo4j and one in SQL, for example. Uh, social net again, and the other one is identified by products. And within the uh, SQL property graph data sources, the graphs are partitioned by the year, for example, they represent. And on the right-hand side, you see the query to access those. So at first, we uh, select the persons from Neo4j, uh, then we select the customers from SQL, and then we do the value join and return the result. So it's basically a federated query system. Right, and uh, in order to create new graphs, you can basically wrap the previous statement into a catalog create graph statement, which allows you to manipulate the catalog and create a new graph in a given namespace under a specific name. So here, 
uh, we basically, the inner statement in that query uh, joins the persons and the customers together, creates a new relationship called same as between them, it's the same example as before, and returns that as a graph, which then is stored under the name uh, US new in the social net namespace, which means it's being stored in Neo4j. So after you execute that query, if you look at the left-hand side, there would be a new graph called US new in Neo4j that basically represents uh, the union of the two graphs plus the additional relationship. Again, graph use is uh, the same concept, except you switch the keyword and uh, define a function. We can create views um, and register them in the catalog, and we can access those views by referring to their name. And as Soren already said, Morpheus integrates with the Neo4j graph algorithms, which uh, we want to demonstrate. Um, so in order to do that, uh, we created a very um, uh, sophisticated demo uh, where, we'll, where we will look at a subset of this demo. So the demo is open source available. The link will be on the next slide. And the data set we are using is Yelp. It's very simple. We have users, and those are the green nodes on this uh, image. Uh, which have some properties and users review businesses. And the reviews have uh, specific properties like uh, stars, like a rating, and the business, of course, has also some location properties and a name. So this is basically uh, an overview of the full demo. Um, it's kind of partitioned into five parts. Uh, on the top right, there's a link to the GitHub repo, which contains all the, all the parts, if you are interested in looking into this. We will focus on uh, just uh, one part of the demo, which is we want to find trending businesses using graph algorithms. So a precondition uh, in order to do that, so that's something that happened in the previous parts of this demo, is that we used Morpheus to build a catalog of uh, different graph projections. So the input graph is basically a business reviews, uh, 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 sorry, a customer reviews a business or a person reviews a business. And we constructed for several years uh, different uh, projections of that graph. So on the, uh, on the bottom left, we have a business, business co-reviewed another business, which means they are, they are co-reviewed if one user reviewed both businesses. We create a new relationship between them. The second one means that if uh, a business has been reviewed by two users, they are connected by a co-reviews relationship. And the one on the top left, uh, top right is um, basically the, the union of those two. We are interested in business co-reviewed business, which is the t uh, bottom left graph projection. So in the demo, we will show you uh, uh, um, an, a simple analytical use case where we compute a trend rank for Yelp businesses. So for two years, 2017 and 2018, we take the business has been co-reviewed with another business graph. Uh, run page rank uh, um, and set a centrality algorithm on top of that to basically measure the, the, the importance of a node within that graph. And then we compare how this uh, page rank basically uh, changed between 2018 and 2017 and call this the trend rank. Um, so let me just switch to IntelliJ. So I, I will get quickly go through that uh, demo and Hopefully it runs while I talk about it. So as you can see here, so this is part four. As I said, it's all open source. You can have a look at it and uh, check it out and try it out. Um, so the first step we do is we register the data sources under specific namespaces. So there's a file system namespace because the projections are stored in parquet files on the local file system on that machine. And there's another data source, which is uh, our Neo4j data source, which basically is the one that we want to use for running the algorithms on. So the first thing we have to do is we have to write to Neo4j and we want to compute page rank. We do that for the year 2017 and the year 2018. For each of those years, we basically, the first thing we do is we basically copy the graph from the file system into Neo4j. That's the statement we execute here. So what we do is we read the graph from the file system namespace, uh, re just return the graph as it is, and create it uh, in the Neo4j namespace under the same name, which means we basically copy it from the file system into Neo4j. That's the first statement. And then we use uh, this Neo4j cipher call here and run um, a procedure within Neo4j, which is part of our graph algorithms library that we uh, also develop in our team. Um, here, there's one algorithm page rank, uh, which we run on the graph. We have just written uh, to Neo4j just some properties that basically define how page rank is configured. And then we specify a property where we store the resulting page rank for each node. It's the so-called write property argument here. And be done with it. 
So that's basically computed in Neo4j now. The next step is that we load the graph back into Spark to compute the trend rank, which is basically the diff between 2018 page rank and 2017 page rank for each uh, business. In order to do that, we say from graph uh, 2017 in Neo4j and uh, give me all the businesses from graph Neo, uh, 2018 in Neo4j, give me all the businesses, join them together on their business ID, which is a uniquely identifying property for the business. And this basically, this statement computes uh, the trend rank, which is a normalized page rank for 2018 and the normalized page rank uh, of 2017, and then just uh, subtract one from the other and create a new property called trend rank on the business nodes that we basically joined together. And then the, the remaining statement is we wanna um, uh, just uh, print the top 10 in terms of trend rank. So we just select the businesses, uh, their names, address, and so on, order by the trend rank we just uh, computed based on our page rank analysis and uh, show the top 10. And this basically brings us to uh, this result that uh, is shown here. So we can see that uh, for example, if you, are, uh, uh, if you are hungry, you should go to BZ Den Tacos because it's a trending business in a specific city in the US. Okay. Um, so in the last uh, few minutes of the talk, uh, we also want to show you um, that Morpheus is basically is binary compatible with Spark Graph, which is what we uh, also develop and um, uh, intend to merge into the Spark project. So on the left-hand side, you see again the module structure that Søren already mentioned uh, in Spark. So there are Spark Cypher, Spark Graph API, which is uh, all based on Spark SQL. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see Morpheus, which is also open source, an open Cypher uh, managed project, which implements the same API. So which means you can basically switch out the dependencies in your project and run Morpheus and get the extra capabilities of property graph data sources, Cypher 10 features, and all the nice stuff uh, we just demonstrated. The module in the middle is called Okapi, uh, which is also an open Cypher project, and it's a Cypher 2 relational uh, compiler. So it takes a Cypher, Cypher statement and constructs uh, uh, relational operators to execute that statement on whatever relational backend, and here it's Spark. Um, so in order to, to show that as a Final example, we go back to the graph app that I uh, showed earlier. So this was uh, this thing where I um, used the Spark Cypher session to create a node data frame, a node data set, and run a simple query on it. And if I switch now to a Morpheus Cypher session, I can uh, get this extra, so I keep this, it's all the same, so it's the same API, so it's uh, meant to run on that one too. And down here, we basically have another methods that basically use Cypher 10 or Morpheus features like registering a data source under a given namespace, um, using those data source we provide, file system one, CSV in that example, run a Cypher 10 query and return the result. Um, and the one thing that I need to do here too is I have to change dependencies of the project. So this is highly a uh, snapshot dependencies. Um, it's just to demonstrate the idea behind it. Oh, sorry. And, um, if I execute this, hopefully it uh, runs. Um, we should see the result that we saw before, which was just the names of the persons that we stored in those data frames, Alice and Bob. But in addition, there should be an output um, that shows us, um, right, that shows us the, the Cypher 10 part of the query. So this is the first result, which is the same one as I showed in the, in the first demo. Uh, and the second one basically is Cypher 10, reading from a file system data source um, and uh, returning the, the, the results, creating new graph, and just displaying the nodes of it, which is basically what we see down here. Cool. So that's it from, uh, from us. Um, like Søren already said, there will be a deep dive technical talk tomorrow by our colleagues uh, Mats and Max, um, who will basically talk about Spark Graph and also Okapi, um, how the compilation of Cypher to Relational works uh, what you can expect from Spark Graph as a feature in Spark 3.0. Um, so we invite you to, uh, to join that talk too if you're interested in the topic. Otherwise, um, that is all we wanted to talk about today and we hope you found it interesting and we have some time for questions. If you have any, if you have any questions, uh, we're happy to run the mic to you.
Hi, um, I've been using graphs in, in different tools like um, i2 that IBM bought and, and Neo4j and, and Spark and I, I, I certainly really appreciate you bringing Cypher language and, and this Neo4j integration and I'm not sure I followed everything but uh, I guess Morpheus is about uh, in the integration step of data yes. but was it also a, a you, you mentioned something about returning graphs and pr continue to process, let's say, in running f uh, more queries and, and stuff on the graph object. That is not uh, possible without Morpheus. Is that the right uh, interpretation? Yes, it's uh, <laughs> not possible without the Cypher 10 support because it's a Cypher 10 feature. Ah, okay. However, um, the SPIP is basically, when we discussed the SPIP and uh, built the proposal, we wanted to uh, focus on a small feature set, which is uh, returning a tabular result as we do in EOVJ, but leave basically the API extendable for um, introducing the multiple graph features later. But we wanted to bring that first feature in and then extend it as we see user um, request, basically. Yes. All right, thank you. Hi, uh, I have a quick question around uh, how do you go about building ego nets versus natural nets uh, in, in Neo4j versus Morpheus? How do you see that in a big data landscape? I didn't understand the first part of the question. Which kind of network are you talking about? So, so any kind of ego uh, networks or natural nets you can build using uh, either Morpheus or Neo4j from a performance perspective, like who would you choose to build these kinds of uh, networks or graph networks? Right, so I'm not familiar with the exact name of ego networks, but um, I'm not a data science scientist, but um, in terms of performance, Neo4j is uh, a database that is built from the bottom to the top, optimized for graph operations and graph storage. Whereas um, Spark, Graph, and also Morpheus builds on top of a relational abstraction which means that if you want to, for example, traverse the graph, so you want to go from one person to another person by a relationship, you basically do a join underneath. Because what, that's what uh, Okapi does. It takes uh, a pattern and basically decomposes it into a series of join operations on the data frames that, or on the tables that uh, uh, represent the graph, which are then implemented by data frames. So in terms of uh, performance, um, I would uh, recommend NeoVJ. Uh, but it depends on your scenario. So the goal of Morpheus is mainly focused on data integration, which means you would never, uh, or you're not supposed to run um, a query that basically spends 10 hops and basically runs through the whole graph and basically collects everything on the driver, for example. That's not the, the idea behind it. The idea is more like you use Morpheus as a data integration tool. You connect, uh, you, you write mappings to your SQL backends, to your HDFS files, to NeoVJ even. Uh, run your federated queries, to do data wrangling, and then write to Neo4j for graph algorithms. That's the, that's the idea behind it. So the queries that you actually run on Morpheus are not uh, comparable to the ones that you would run in Neo4j. So it's a bit different from that perspective. How would you go about exploring uh, from, a, from a point of exploration? Would you, can you load the entire Neo4j into the Spark world, or is just an exploration step by step? I mean, you can, um, of course, you can load the Neo4j, your graph that is stored in Neo4j into Morpheus and then do explorative queries. But if, if it's explorative queries that are basically point queries, so something like I start at a very specific node, like a specific person, for example, a social network, and then I traverse the graph, Neo4j is the, is the system I would use for that use case, for exploration, right? But if you have a query that basically, as we saw before, we want to compute the uh, possible friends for each person and its possible friend of a friend, so basically a global query compared to a local query in an OLTP system, I would recommend Morpheus to do that. Could you load a part of, uh, part of natural net into the Spark and do the exploration in the Spark using Morpheus? Um, I mean, if you, so you can specify when you connect to Neo4j, you, you're not 
uh, you don't need to load the complete graph from NeoVJ into Spark. You can select the subgraph you're interested in by specifying exactly the labels and the relationship types uh, you are interested in. Uh, we call it a schema, basically. Um, so yes, you can uh, basically select a subgraph and do your exploration or analysis on top of that. Thank you. Welcome. All right, that marks the end of our time. I'm sure the speakers will be happy to answer questions at the back of the hall. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you. Thank you.